Ja, herzlich willkommen hier. Hello, ladies and gentlemen, I wish a very warm welcome is here online um, for our event of today, the present of the past 30 years of the disintegration of the Soviet Union here today, organized by the Federal Foundation for the Study of the Communist Dictatorship in Eastern Germany and organized. You're also very warm welcome on behalf of the representative of the Federal um, government taking care of this topic. So we have been dealing with processes of transitional justice and how to come to terms with the past during the last months. And my name is Tamina Kutcher. I'm editor-in-chief of the medium and online platform decoder.org. And we deal especially with um, Russia and Belarus. And these two countries are represented here today and we will deal with them. And we will also talk about the situation in Ukraine today. So it is all about the um, coming to terms with um, history. And like I've already said, our events titled today is the present of the past, 30 years after the disintegration of the Soviet Union. So you ladies and gentlemen, you read the news and you might know or you may know that our today's topic is quite up to date. So the prosecutor, the Russian prosecutor said that um, the international memorial, the organization memorial should be um, stopped and disintegrated. The memorial has even been during the perestroika time. It has been a very important organization dealing with um, the past, with the history of Stalin, with um, the victim, the compensation of victims and how, and they are, they are advocates for the protection of human rights in, in Russia. And the trial has already been started. It has been suspended and postponed to December 28th at the highest court in Moscow. And the whole process um, has been criticized and drawn attention or got attention by the international community. And the question is, what does this mean or what does that um, show? What is the message con conveyed um, from the part of the people or what happens to the people dealing with the past and trying to come into terms and working with the past in Russia? We will also talk about Belarus today. So from the violent... Um, um, fight against after uh, during the presidential elections in 2020, August 2020, there has been the riots have been beaten down um, violently. And um, Heiko Maas talked about that there are many political prisoners in Belarus, um, a lot of um, activists, human rights activists are um, taken into custody. There are more than a hundred cases of torture reported and Heiko Maas said that um, there is a huge problem when it comes to human rights in Belarus. And we've received um, the news that Sergei the Zeganovsky, the husband of um, Mr. Tiarnovskaya, has been put into prison or has been sentenced, sentenced to prison for 18 years. So civil society tries where it is still existent, tries to fight against the situation. And we will deal with this topic today, tonight. And we will also discuss about it, of course. And from Ukraine, um, no good news coming from this country. Unfortunately, for months, we can observe um, a, the a buildup of troops, of Russian, um, Russian military troops at the border, on the border to Ukraine. And there have been a lot of discussions and a lot of um, dialogue has been taking place. And even though you know that the war started in 2014, um, more than thousands of people have died and there is a lot of dialogue going on. But nevertheless, um, the question is whether this war influences the way of commemorating and the memory of the people. And 
I would like to invite you, ladies and gentlemen, you are very much invited to take part in the discussion. You can use the Q&A function and ask your questions, write them into the chat or use the Q&A function and um, participate. So now, first of all, I would like to wish a very warm welcome to my guests. We have Alicia Belanovic pitts from Minsk originally. She's, she's a historian and she is a freelance product manager a manager and she also worked for the project documentation of life history interviews from former slaves and forced laborers she worked at the for um she dealt with the psycho social work with persecutees in hamburg she has been living in berlin for some years and like i've already said she is a project manager working for dgo and she is in charge of projects or she is in charge of the coordination um, with Belarusian German history um, representatives or historians for the German Society for Eastern European Studies. We have Yuri Dukort here from Ukraine. He is a freelance journalist, translator, producer and publicist, and he studied German and you may know his political analysis and commentaries um, in the German-speaking media. And he is also an um, interpreter. He works as an interpreter and translator. And together with Sabine Stör, for example, he um, translated some novels by the Ukrainian writer Zardan, and he also received the translation prize by the Leipzig Book Fair in 2018 or 2014 and 18. And we do have Misha Gabovic here online. He is a historian and sociologist and works, or he is research associate at the Einstein Foreign in Potsdam. He um, is especially an expert in the field of protest, social uprisings and movements. And he's very much interested um, in the structural similarities when it comes to um, protest movements and commemoration or memorial movements. So lovely to have you here, Misha. We all know we are on a personal basis because we know each other from our private life and our um, professional life. And Misha, I would like to start with you first of all. So we've received statements from you, from all of you, and like I've already said, the process against memorial is um, has been a huge... People have been surprised, but negatively, of course, and they are frightened also here in Germany. In your statement, you say that the recent attack on memorial has um, provoked a lot of talking about re -Salinization. And in fact, the ways in which the Soviet past is confronted in Russia today, or are confront is confronted in Russia today, um, is much more multi-layered, and it's important to understand and um, the complexity of the topic. So, what does that mean? I mean, Memorial is not only just one organization; it's the organization advocating for and um, coming to terms with the past and naming the perpetrators. And what what is about the um, discourse in or the narrative in Russia. So first of all, I would like to avoid misunderstandings. First of all, it is a catastrophe, of course. The, um, the solution is a huge problem. Or it, the destruction of memorial is a huge problem for all people dealing with the past in Russia. And for me personally, I'm I'm really touched by this because I have been in been in touch with this organization for years. A lot of the founding, many of the founding members um, have been in contact with my family. But I think it is of utmost importance to understand that we do not deal with an attempt to um, to re-Stalinize the country ideologically. We have to make a separation. So first of all, there is an attack to independent or an attack of independent organizations and the topics they deal with and in terms of um, political history. And we do have to, we need to understand that the Russian um, government is not ideological. So the ideology is to, to stay in power. And this is why, especially now, 
um, ever since the the summer last year, um, the, ever since the last protest wave of protest in Russia, many independent organizations in all different fields um, have been harassed. They have been destroyed. And there are a lot of um, projects that are state funded um, that deal with or that try to come to terms or to to deal with the past with the Stalin Stalinist past. So uh, there is no neo Stalinist or some kind of um, Soviet nostalgia going on. No, it is all about staying in power and then you know avoiding that people become too an autonomous and these people becoming too free to autonomous um have to be they have to be stopped and there are a lot of initiatives organizations and even a state led or funded gulag museum dealing with this topic but nevertheless it is of utmost importance to understand the complexity of um this topic and you know not to become too personal when it comes to the analysis um, of our picture image of Russia, because there's a lot of emotion involved and, and injected into um, our way of perceiving or in, or in the perception of Russia. So don't you think that this has an impact on how the work, on how to deal with the past, coming to terms with the past? And I mean, Memorial has been working with a lot of state um, agencies, organs, representatives, etc., because um, they have also worked, they have given advice, they gave advice to the government when it comes to this topic, but nevertheless, um, they've named the perpetrators by name and this ideology you talked about um you know shirakova she also one of the founding members she talked about this topic just recently um two days ago i think here in the in the foundation and we have this kind of this um ideology um dealing with different, you know, different fields of ideology and the past. And everybody can use what kind of, um, let's say, part, a part of the past suits um, him. But I mean, when the general prosecution or the prosecutor general of Russia um, accuses Memorial and so a organization naming the perpetrators, what does that mean? I think this is not the most important point that they named the perpetrators. I would like to give you an example because in Russia, we have the Zinis Karaguyan case, a philosopher from Tomsk in Siberia. And for years, he is quite popular on the internet and he's leading and organizing a campaign and naming the KGB um, employees who murdered his grandfather in the 1930s. And he, well, for him, it is of utmost importance to name concrete people and to name their, to give, to give the, to publish the concrete names and to, um, and he, he tries to pretend that he can put them on trial. But I mean, this I'm quite skeptical, to be honest, because it is not about, um, let's say, retaliation or vengeance. It is all about um, the access to, to the system and repressions. And I think this is not the problem that Memorial um, gave names of the perpetrators because they do much more. I think um, compared to other organizations, uh, Memorial is rather concentrating on the victims. It is about naming or let's say making the names of the victims more important to put them in the center of the interest and this is what they do. And the problem, in my opinion, is not what they do in terms of coming to terms with the past, um, historical policy, political history, etc. No, it is all about um, their cooperation, their collaboration with um, state agencies or administrations because they receive, by doing this, they received access, they gained access to archives in Moscow, for example. And there is this one um, memorial remembering or let's say commemorating the names of the um, Stalin victims. But I think 
In this case, the problem is that the state power, the government tries to find a, let's say, a way for the Kremlin as administration to to walk this thin line of e extreme ideologies. And of course, um, they try to take into consideration the interests of, of the ultra ultra orthodox church for example and on the other side we do have the history policy and they try to make some outsourcing of it some kind of and the church plays an important role and it became even more important in the last years and directly and indirectly they have their own museums they organize their own museums they get involved when it comes to the content of school books of textbooks and then we have other organizations being in charge and planning centrally memorials, museums, providing them with content and documents, etc. And I mean, they are a bit more patriotic, but even within the church and within this historic organization, there are different voices that want to be heard. So from our point of view, so we are people advocating for coming to terms with the past um, in a democratic way. And we want to, we are against the, or we condemn um, the Stalin era and the system and what we have the good and the bad ones. And I think from the, st from the point of view of um, the Russian state and the power, it is all about finding a balance. And from the point of view of the presidential administration, they try to find a balance. And in our opinion, it is rather a backlash. Can we say that this uh, ideology uh, also fosters a syncretism of history, a kind of rubber history? Uh, because this is a discourse that Memorial is not supporting. Everyone can take uh, details from uh, the different epochs. But what is underlying is that this is the story of a powerful Russia with a strong man at its head. And Memorial is the organization which is most visible and which, of course, contradicts this history, which uh, shows the ruptures of this history and reminds of the perpetrators and the victims. Yes, that's true. But Memorial is not the only organization. Of course, they were the first ones. They were the pioneers. And anybody who is working in this field today uh, could not be uh, imagined without the work that Memorial has done. And indeed, there is a common denominator in the uh, official uh, view of history, and that is the strength of the state. The best example or the best places where you can get to know uh, this are the um, historical parks, Russia, my history, which are uh, very popular all over the country and which have to do uh, a lot with uh, the great influence of the Russian Orthodox Church. These are multimedia parks which tell the story of the history of Russia. Russia was always uh, doing well, was thriving when it had a powerful leader who held all the strings in his hands. And you can integrate everything into this kind of history, both the dissidents and uh, those who persecuted the dissidents. But I would say that public criticism of this point, of this view, um, is not very popular, but it is po uh, tolerated. And I would say that uh, if the problem was just a uh, discursive criticism of this uh, view of history, then the reaction wouldn't be as radical as it is. I think the problem is rather that Memorial is standing for much more. It's also a human rights organization. It is an organization which has always acted very independently. It is an organization with an enormous um, international reputation that it really deserves. And I think all of this makes the organization a threat. What is perceived or it is perceived as a threat. I think that it doesn't uh, threaten anybody neither the state apparatus, but it is perceived as a threat. And not only this organization, this happened to very many independent organizations in the past months. 
that's true. Um, very many critical actors, uh, the media, NGOs, and so on, uh, suffered the same fate. But can you really uh, separate these two things? And which signal is sent if a prosecutor general's office uh, is trying to liquidate Memorial? Memorial is not a small organization. It's the most important organization in this field. What kind of signal does this send into the regions and also to other players who are much smaller? There's also the signal that no matter how much an organization is protected from the West, no matter how much solidarity they get or how, how well known they are, we are not interested in it. Yes, um, I completely agree with that, but I wouldn't claim that we uh, can um, attribute this to the content of Memorial's work. Because this is actually the potential fate of anybody at the moment, no matter whether they support LGBT rights or organize social projects or whatever. So it's really, just as you've said, uh, about giving the feeling, giving everybody the feeling that nobody is safe. And even if you won dozens of international awards and if you are perceived as the most important organization in your field all over the world, then this does not mean that the state can't do any harm to you. And uh, even um, when the Nobel Prize uh, winner uh, uh, was announced uh, just recently, then Putin said, um, well, he can't do, he is not allowed to do everything. He still has to follow our rules. And uh, the Nobel Prize was awarded to a journalist and not to somebody who was uh, dealing with processing history. So um, I don't want to um, protect the um, state power of Russia. I just wanted to understand the logic behind this all. And uh, people who are living in the Russian regions want to deal with these topics of reappraisal of history. Um, they... Uh, see that um, the main reason for the liquidation of memorial is not the content, but its independence. Up until today, in uh, the regions, there are many organizations, museums, and so on, which are dealing with this topic, but which are much smaller. Yes, definitely, they are smaller, they have less influence, they um, act on a regional level, they work in a way uh, which many people in Germany would rather uh, criticize because they don't uh, separate clearly between uh, glorifying soldiers from the Second World War and uh, reappraising um, ter uh, the terror and so on. So everything is much more complex and it is not that all of them are uh, oppressed now, uh, because um, firstly, it is important how independent is an organization and what is the situation like in the regions, because not everything that is happening in Moscow is automatically reproduced in the regions. Sometimes the repressive initiatives uh, are started by regional players. Um, they don't come from uh, the pre presidential administration. So the disappropriation of Perm 36, uh, this um, memorial complex uh, in uh, the Ural region is a good example of this. And um, on the other hand, sometimes there are signals coming from Moscow and representatives of regional repressive uh, authorities think that they have to copy this behavior. Yeah, this can be a very strong signal. Maybe we can come back to this later. Um, we uh, will also talk about uh, Belarus and uh, the actions against uh, independent actors. But uh, Irina Sherbakova said uh, some days ago, um, she was asking, what are the reasons for this development? If we go back to uh, the beginning, um, Irina Shabakova says that the reasons are that in 91, when uh, there we saw um, 
the toppling of Dzerzhinsky in front of the KGB main headquarters in Moscow, that at that time archives weren't opened completely, illustration did not take place, and elites continued and so on. How would you um, assess that? Was something very decisively missed in the 90s? Well, these are th several things I would like to separate. I work in archives a lot, and I would be very happy if access to archives was easier, in particular to some archives. And if uh, and I would be happy uh, if archives weren't closed again, uh, what is actually happening in uh, Russia at the moment. But I wouldn't say that the current political system is uh, acting the way it is because the archives weren't opened. Uh, I wouldn't uh, say that archives have such a large significance, unfortunately. And when it comes to illustration, uh, I really can't imagine that in a country as such as Russia, particularly in the 90s, such illustration could have taken place, illustration that, for example, took place in the Czech Republic, in Eastern Germany, and in some other Central Eastern European countries. The society is different, the political system was different, and there was much too much political staff and uh, also participating in these processes. It was not, not a society that had lived through 40 years of socialism and uh, state bureaucracy, but many more years. And there were some attempts, for example, to uh, prohibit uh, the Communist Party, but I think that it, this would not have worked then, to be honest. So why? The, they would have to imp uh, imprison too far too many people. And who uh, should have done that? Yeltsin, who was the uh, head of the Communist Party for many years, and many of his people were also members of the Communist Party. Even in uh, the occupied West Germany of the late 40 and early 50, uh, uh, 40s and early 50s, um, a complete illustration did not take place. Uh, large hopes uh, were mentioned then, but it was not possible because there was not enough staff to do that. And there was not enough support even uh, from um, the uh, Social Democratic Party uh, in the 50s. Um, so um, it was just not possible to um, exclude a large number of people who participate who had participated in national socialist crimes and in russia even more people were involved in the system what we can um, we the way we perceive illustration uh, this would not have been possible there but as a result today we see a president who was a former member of the KGB and a former member of the Secret Service and, and who uh, supports his former colleagues and makes um, them part of the current elites. Wouldn't it have been possible to process this history more? Well, uh, Putin... Um, got uh, the possibility to become uh, so influential because of his predecessor, who uh, was an anti-communist at the beginning. So uh, who do we denounce when we say, oh, this should have happened in a different way? Yeltsin was the one who um, talked about this or who even um, deployed a whole team in order to uh, prohibit the Communist Party. And after several attempts, he uh, made this former KGB person his head of government. And then he was quite happy to um, receive an amnesty uh, after uh, Putin uh, became president. And even Gorbachev, who is glorified in the West until today, he several times said that he thinks Putin is quite okay. So um, I think the, the, this is all very complex and difficult. And I think that um, 
Um, there was no independent political elite at no point of time which could have carried out such illustration. So we have to separate between uh, what would be desirable and what uh, was doable in political terms. And we also have to resist uh, the thought that there is such an ideal model, uh, maybe the West German, Western German model that uh, could work everywhere uh, and it could be just adapted a little bit to uh, the different countries' situations. And um, if this doesn't work, then we just say people didn't do it in the right way. But Russia is not Ukraine, it's not Lithuania, it's not Uzbekistan, it's not Belarus, it's not Germany. Well, yes, of course, the situation in the different countries is different, but but so we want to understand why Russia is the way it is today. And this also implies that um, some elites and some structures keep uh, existing and keep continuing. But here we would like to put a full stop and uh, we would like to um, go on to Belarus. Alessia, um, we also asked you to send us a, a quote, and you say that never before in the independent history of Belarus has the Soviet past been as present as it is today. Show trials against supposed enemies, state propaganda, discrediting the opponent and the power of the KGB. One year after the crushing of the peaceful revolution, many Belarusians now are facing the question of how to protect themselves from state power and yet not lose hope for political change. Yeah, Alessia. Uh, so, Alessia, after the suppression of the protests, more than 300 NGOs have been closed. They're closed now. And the archives have not been, they haven't been, they have been closed under Lukashenko. And so what is your opinion or what about the situation in Belarus today and what about the current situation, what about the reappraisal or let's say how to come to terms, how to process um, the past. So maybe you can you give us some information on what happened. So, talking about the context of Belarus and the, like, say, his history, historical sciences, and um, coming to terms with the past, then we have to have a look at two areas: the research at the university, the academies of of um, sciences, the state institutions, and um, research in general. And of course, um, they advocate for, I think, in the mid-90s, um, it became even more complicated to um, do research in an ind independent way beca because it became even more ideological. And during the last 20 years, different researchers, um, if when they have tried to do their research in a consequent and independent way, dealing with them, um, Soviet repressions or I'm um, dealing with the latest or the let's say newest history of the Soviet Union etc then um, they paid their work with their career so in this context I could say that in the last 20 years there have been a lot of projects been created I would like to name a few projects mid in the 2020s, there has been the, um, the history workshop in Minsk. This is a Belarusian German um, project, and I have been working at the university and my um, peer students. For us, it has been the first place where we could have been working in the context of, of World War II. We did not only talk about partisans, but about um, the victims of the war. And this has been a place or a context where we talked about SS forced laborers or the prisoners and where they they found their voice. And we, because we just talked in the past, we talked about the heroes of the war, but here we had the opportunity to talk about um, another part or another aspect of um, the World War II history. And during the last years, several projects in the um, in terms of history and coming to terms with um, history, new um, projects have been created and we have um, one project, one archive project that has been started or that was started in 2012 
and the Nusha Pamyak um, archive, and they deal or they display, they show different histories of life. They collect the stories, the life stories of Belarusians that have been rather um, taboos um, or areas of taboo. So in this archive, we have up to 2,000 interviews led with Stalinist victims, victims of the Stalinist, Stalin repressions. There have been some field research during, um, going on in the south of Belarus, where his where historians um, went and they they made interviews and they recorded them with Belarusians in the south of um, the country, the Belize region, where um, there has been a famine all, taking place also after the Second World War. So um, they had interviews with um, um, ghetto survivors, Holocaust, um, Holocaust survivors, interviews on the topic of of the 19th September 1939, how the inhabitants in the western part of um, Belarus, so under um, during the years between the First and Second World War, how they experienced um, this period and the so-called um, unification of the Belarusian population or people. And this has been, um, these are topics that have not been, you know, they have been, let's say, let's say suppressed kind of, or, or not dealt, they have not been dealt with um, by historians because the organization of historians um, here in Belarus, they have been active since... 2000 and the the general manager has has been arrested and they are under arrest at home now so this organization has not been let's say stopped or liquidated but they can't work anymore because they are under arrest so it is not we do not you know, the focus is not on, on a scientific or research career. It's about um, mere surviving. And when we talk about the different niches, then there is the product Eclap, a European College of Liberal Arts project. And during the last 10 years, different educational offers and programs have been created for young people being interested in um, history, the urban history of Belarus and um, gender-based, gender-specific topics. So this organization has been stopped or it has been kind of... Um, and they can't work on him anymore. So the whole team had to leave the country um, in order to be able to, to 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 survive and to proceed with their work. So I think there are niches we can talk about, and they have it has already been there um, during the last years, but they are closed now in the civil society area. But unfortunately, I can't make a separation like Misha did before because in this case. It was not only about independent stakeholders or actors, but it was also about the work of these of these independent stakeholders. And of, furthermore, it is all about political opinion or political ideas of these actors, because especially these groups of researchers and scientists dealing with critical topics. This group of, of scientists, of stakeholders, they kind of um, reopened the wounds of an authoritarian state and um, talked about them. And um, Lukashenko's um, power um, construction or system tries to close these gaps or these niches. So you said that there is... Um, the this kind of historical research um, taking care or dealing with the niches and um, reopening um, the wounds, talking about terror, the Holocaust uh, caused um, the Shoah, 
in, in Belarus? What has been the narrative or what is the official narrative when it comes to these topics and what is the counter narrative, so to speak? In my opinion, the problem is that the official narrative especially refers um, refers especially um, to the the heroes and the heroic history and in Belarus we have the museum of the second patriotic war and you have to go there to understand this narrative because the whole museum is made of military vehicles and residues of, of, of the military and referring or retelling this heroic um, story, history kind of. And there is this small niche, this gap dealing with the Holocaust, but um, not only referring to um, the Jews, but also and the deportation of Belarusians and um, that they were, have been forced to, to work in the camps. But um, there is this one um, museum of utmost importance dealing with the patriotic war, the great patriotic war, and a quite strong and clear signal for many researchers and scientists shows that it becomes more and more um, difficult to do or to, to do re independent research. And there's a legislation, the legislation on the genocide on the Belarusian people that has been um, adopted unanimously by the um, government. And this legislation referring to the Belarusian, to the genocide um, of the Belarusian people. And if um, this genocide is denied, then people were put into prison or they will be fined. So there are a lot of things that are not really, you know, it's a bit fuzzy. We do not know what this means. You know, when somebody does research in the field of the Holocaust, do you deny the genocide on um, of the Belarusian, pe Belarusian people? No, or we do not know. Or what does that mean? I So um, it's a bit fuzzy, you know, because in this official version, we do not know what, there are a lot of um, gaps that have to be filled and of course people are insecure also especially the researchers and they do not know how to interpret this legislation and an even um, greater signal is the indictment here in Belarus because Daichis he became famous three years ago because he published a historian um, blog or a historical blog called 1969 and it was about oh, 1863 and with his blog he became famous because he talked or he published a lot of information on um, historic facts and he um, processed them especially when the Belarusian government talked about um, tight links or close links to the Russian government. So it was about um, the history of, of Belarus in the past. Um, and it was, he, he did not talk about the friendship between the Belarusian people or the Russian people. And today that he has been sentenced to prison for 13 years for the incitement of masses and, and people. And of course, these are signals received by the researchers and showing them that um, they, they are not only jeopardized or threatened to lose their job or not to be able to continue or they say, right, they their PhD thesis, no, their, their life is in danger. So if I understood it correctly, you say that the regime, that the government needs this official narrative for its own legitimization, for its own legitimacy. And if somebody is against it, he or she is silenced. Is that correct? Well, basically, yes, but 
Also es ist momentan nicht nur im Bereich Geschichtswissenschaft. It's not only in terms, you know, this does not only applies, does not only apply to the field or in the field of, of historians or history, but everybody who thinks outside the box or thinks in a different way um, is silenced. For example, when you when you use Telegram and when you send a, a message via Telegram, then you can be sentenced or put into prison. And um, this is, you know, this applies or this is everybody um, thinking in a critical way is concerned. But I think you refer to the following. So on the background, the background of the um, situation in the country and when it comes to, you know, justifying the relationship to Russia, etc., and the political situation, then um, what happens? That is right. And one more example. This legislation about the genocide of the Belarusian people, uh, there were some um, scientists uh, and scholars in Belarus commenting on this. In two days, uh, one uh, scholar who had second thoughts about this legislation and mentioned them, uh, he was searched and he had to leave the country very quickly. And this shows that any expression of opinion that does not correspond to the official ideology um, is dangerous. It is dangerous to talk about such things. Alicia, we, um, I think we will... Um, Stop here after you gave us a very sad impression about what is going on in Belarus. We will come back to Belarus later. We will talk about possible wishes for the future and um, the precise things we can do in order to support historians at the moment. But um, now I would like to continue with Ukraine and Yuri. Yuri, we also asked you to send us your statement and you said the following. The ghosts of the Soviet Union live on. They manifest themselves not only in prefabricated buildings, industrial ruins, or monstrous monuments. The tragic memories of Soviet terror continue to shape the culture of remembrance in Ukraine today. The Holodomor, a, fa a famine artificially introduced by Stalin's regime that claimed over three million victims, remains the greatest Ukrainian trauma to this day. End of quote. Yuri, yeah. you say that the ghosts of the Soviet Union live on. If we look back uh, 30 years ago in 91, the Ukrainian um, society was also not a monolith. Also in its perception of politics of history, the, um, the gap uh, was uh, more or less between uh, the eastern and the western part. Um, and in some parts of the country, the Soviet regime was perceived as an occupation. In others, um, there was also uh, it was also always highlighted that Ukraine was fighting for its independence. And there were also parts of the country where people identified the Soviet narrative and politics of remembrance. Now we heard some things about Russia and uh, Belarus. We heard about uh, ruptures and continuations in the historical reappraisal. Um, and this particularly applies to, applies to Ukraine. Which developments were taking place uh, there since 2001, uh, that since 1991? And what would you say? Where is Ukraine um, standing today when it comes to coming to terms with the past? I think uh, this was a rather slow development. It was not always um, linear. It was a development that uh, always went into one direction, but it was a slow one. After the collapse of the Soviet Union, we started from uh, the same uh, 
starting point, um, the successor states of the Soviet Union, but also the Eastern European uh, countries which belonged to the Warsaw Pact um, earlier. And today, we see that the situation in these countries are very different. And this has to do with the development of the past 30 years. The remembrance of the Holodomor was possibly one thing that led to the development of a common Ukrainian identity. But I think that this was not uh, the, the pivotal point in um, processing the past, although this topic dominated uh, the discourse for some time in uh, the early um, years uh, after 2000 under Yushchenko, this was the central topic when Yushchenko in 2006 uh, declared that uh, in, a, in a law um, that the Holodomor more was uh, declared a genocide of the Ukrainian people. Um, but I would also like to uh, come back to what you talked about with Misha Gabovich. Um, because uh, at the beginning in uh, the Ukraine, um, there was also no lustration taking place. And there is a, a thesis which says that in the post-Soviet states, except uh, the Baltic states, uh, there was no change of elites. I think that this uh, thesis of Logan Way, and he uh, um, divides uh, the post-Soviet states into three groups, depending on how strong the civil society developed um, in uh, or existed in the past. And on one hand, we have uh, the Central Asian states where in the past there were only very few civil society traditions or none at all. And there, autocratic regimes and dictatorships established very quickly. On the other hand, we have got the Baltic states, which uh, rather swiftly transformed and uh, were society to control over politics. And we've got the European part, this mixed group uh, where Russia and Ukraine are part of uh, Moldova, part some of the Caucasian states, where there was neither a strong civil society, strong enough to take over control, nor uh, the post-communists were able to continue their rule. And in the first phase, both in Russia and the Ukraine, there was a compromise between the old elites and the national democrats or the liberal democrats uh, in uh, Russia. At the end, in both countries, the old elites came back to power. And the question is, when did uh, the country start to develop into different directions? There were two attempts in uh, Ukraine to establish autocratic regimes um, in the late Kuchma era and under Yanukovych. And both attempts led to uh, rebellions, a revolution. Oh, I wouldn't call these... Um, uh, uprisings, uh, revolutions, although they uh, are called the Orange Revolution and the Euromaidan Revolution now, but a revolution means that the fundament of society is reorganized and this did not take place neither in 2004 nor in 2013 and 14. But these were two uprisings which prevented this. So the worst was prevented uh, but maybe not the best was reached, but uh, the worst was uh, prevented. Another question is, why did this not happen in Russia? Because there were also protests in Russia, particularly after the Duma elections 2011, after the presidential elections of 2011. And I think there are many reasons for this, and I don't have... Um, 
a single answer to this question. You could say that the Ukrainian society is organized differently. We have different civil society traditions in Ukraine. But I still think this, this is just part of the answer. Another part of the answer is uh, access to resources. Russia always had access to natural resources. Ukraine never had it. And so on. So today we have reached a point where societies um, already have developed in rather different uh, directions. One good example of this is uh, nostalgia. In Ukraine, uh, you could say that about 30% of the society feel nostalgic about the Soviet system, but this figure has Um, has changed continuously since, since 2010. There is a clear tendency and uh, the younger generation of people from 18 to 30, this nostalgia is no longer existing. But what would you say? Why is uh, this the case in Ukraine? Does this have, have, has this to do uh, with the good reappraisal of the past or does it have to do with um, the legislation of the remembrance. So if you declare uh, the Holodomor a genocide or the act that was taken in Ukraine in 2015, um, they always, this legislation always has a certain meaning uh, in order to make history a means of um, keeping society together, supporting certain discourses and narratives uh, which uh, make a society feel um, solidaric. Uh, so these are means to legitimize a state in Ukraine. Um, also because of the war which we mentioned earlier, the situation is uh, not stable. And I always ask myself, how much does such a legislation uh, make a society uh, more stable and more solidaric? And uh, in how far are certain aspects just neglected? It's difficult to say. The laws were adopted late, uh, the Holodomor law that was taken in 2006 and the so-called Lustration Act it was adopted, I think, in 2016. I think the war played a much more important role in this question of um, finding one's own identity. With the beginning of the war, many people uh, lost their nostalgic feelings about the Soviet past. Uh, and uh, this holds true for all age groups. And I think that this was uh, the turning point for the further developments. This played a much more important role than any um, legislation um, that took place earlier. So this was a very long and a very slow development. But Yuri, excuse me, but I would like to interrupt you. This is a very interesting question. And how far did the war also have an ambivalent um, meaning for the development. On the one hand, it mobilizes and strengthens identities, also in terms of uh, politics of history. But on the other hand, um, the war also means that a, a programmatic um, narrative of the state is put into the focus and other things are just neglected. What kind of stories are not told or what kind of history is not told? We heard about Belarus and 
we heard that um, when it comes to the Holocaust uh, in Belarus, um, it's just said that there was a genocide of the Belarusian people, but not a genocide of the Jews. But if we look at Ukraine and we look at, for example, Babin Yar, and we also received a question from the audience, the debates about Babin Yar and uh, the erection of a memorial in this place of terror have been going on for decades. Um, why um, have there been so long, such long debates about this place? Doesn't this also have to do with the question of um, um, also the fact that Ukrainians also were perpetrators? Or well, this is a difficult um, topic, and I think a victim mentality is present in almost any society. Um, people love to reappraise. Um, crimes against one's own people and are not that much willing to deal with own crimes, which is always much more difficult. In Ukrainian history, we also have the problem uh, that has to do with Ukrainian nationalism of the 20th century or which started in the 20th century with Ukrainian nationalism and which became obvious particularly during the Second World War. Today, the Ukrainian nationalists, the OAN and uh, the Ukrainian rebellion army are perceived as fighters for independence. They are glorified, they are celebrated. They were indeed fighters for independence of the Ukraine. But on the other hand, During the war, they also committed crimes. And this is not much talked about, and uh, people try to forget about this. The, um, the ideology which emerged in the 1930s was a very, to a very totalitarian one. It's changed a bit uh, in the course of the time, but this ideology doesn't play any role any longer today. And we also see this, for example, um, when we look at the nationalist parties in Ukraine, they um, are, they have almost no importance. They are not presented in parliament. They didn't have any chance during the presidential elections. And uh, right-wing extremism has a much larger influence in Western Europe and in other neighboring countries, but not in Ukraine. So the problem remains with us. But don't you think, what they do like is to talk about these people and that they have, that they fought for Ukraine's independence, but they don't like talking about um, what happened and that um, crimes have been committed, committed during this fight. And this narrative is kind of um, promoted and strengthened um, by this kind of law from 2015 and being part of a package, of, of a legislative package. And one says that it's illegal to, uh, to, to put into question the legitimacy of the fight for the independence of Ukraine. And I mean, this leads to, let's say, underpinning and talking about one side and letting, you know, hiding the other side or not talking about the other one, the other aspect. I mean, maybe this could, this could, I mean, I understood that this could influence, you know, the historic research. Well, for historians, I won't say that it's not possible that they, to talk about this problem. No, this is not the case because they are several researchers I'm trying to um, talk about this and tackle this problem and to talk about this topic. But when it comes to, but the mainstream topic is what I've just talked about. Yeah. Um, All right. Thank you so much. Now, I would like to use the last 15 minutes of our discussion to compare um a topic regarding Ukraine. So the picture, the image of what kind of image of the Soviet Union is um, 
kind of drawn or shown. So this um, nostalgia when it comes to the Soviet Union in the population is not existent, especially not due to the war. And does this kind of reinforce or underpin that the people do not have this feeling of nostalgia, that they don't feel it? But what do you think? What about Russia and the Soviet Union? Are they put at the same level? Are they equal when it comes to this narrative? And this phenomenon, you talked about that, um, th that this has been created or reinforced by the war. Well, psych psychologically speaking, I think Russia is um, compared with the Soviet Union. It's put at the same level. I didn't say, or I won't say that there is no... Um, nostalgia within the population. That's not the case. I just, I refer to the younger population. I mean, I think 10 to 15 um, percent of the people um, at the age from 18 to 30 years might be or might fancy this kind of nostalgia. But I think around about 30 percent of the people um, are sad or they have been said after um, the collapse of the Soviet Union because they they wanted to have it back. And well, I mean, I think this is kind of a counter trend um, when we compare it with the trend or um, in Russia. And since 2010, this nostalgia after the collapse of the Soviet Union has continuously been increased in Russia. And I think it's also interesting that the Ukrainians um, see or perceive the Soviet time quite differentiated or in a differentiated way, because on one hand, they perceive, they say they, are po they have been positive and negative moments at the same time. And there's just a small majority, a small group, let's say 23 to 18 or 18 percent saying that there has only been negative, there have only been negative moments or aspects when it comes to the Soviet Union or the Soviet time. And this is quite interesting because in some areas, many Ukrainians think that it has been or that the times has been better, have been better during the Soviet Union. I mean, in terms of the medical coverage or medical supply, health coverage, and also when it comes to... Um, let's say, the quality of life. Uh, but there is kind of a balanced picture, I would say, nowadays. But nevertheless, there are a lot of people who are convinced that the situation is different today, especially in the area of, of the freedom of press, freedom of opinion, freedom of speech, and especially in terms of the possibilities to... Um, develop oneself or to, to lead an independent and self-reliable life, kind of, or self-supported life. So most of the Ukrainian regions are not really in favor of nostalgia after the collapse of the Soviet Union, but there are some parts um, that are controlled by the Ukraine. I mean, this, re this study has not been um, conducted or done in the occupied areas, but in some regions, there is this feeling or the majority of people feel this, this kind of, this feeling of nostalgia. But nevertheless, there are corporate, there are, there's a relation when it comes to the age and also the um, level of education and the level of, of income, the income level. So I don't know whether there is a clear, crystal clear correlation, but the better um, the education level is, um, the less or fewer nostalgic feelings are there. And... Um, the bigger or let's say um, the higher the income level, um, the better people feel. I mean, so Misha, we've had that um, in Russia since 2010, um, the study conducted by Nevada said that nostalgia is increased. I mean, what does it mean? I mean, it doesn't mean anything at all because um, 
what does this mean, this being sad that it's over, that the Soviet Union is over? And what about nostalgia? What does it mean? What is the Soviet Union? What has it been? Um, on one side, there's the perception of the repressive, the re um, government and on the other side it's one version of the Russian Empire where um, all the other independent state have been part or are part of Russia and I mean it depends on how you ask the question you will receive different um, answers of course in Russia there are these very strong imperial feelings this urge this need um, or this feeling to be recognized as a powerhouse, as a huge power and political power being important. And um, of course, geopolitical influence in the neighboring countries of, is of utmost importance. And even this idea of reconquering them is one part of the narrative. But um, like Yuri already said, when it comes to U Ukraine, I mean, um, people refer to a better health and education system with um, more equal um, opportunities for everybody. I mean, the difference is not that the systems um, got worse, no, but that inequalities are on a rise and that um, the wage or the income is this becomes more and more decisive. And, and some people say, okay, everything that I've experienced took place in the Soviet Union and elderly people um, are rather, they tend rather to, let's say, um, glorify their teenage years in the Soviet Union compared to those people who haven't lived in, in, in the Soviet Union. So I think those quantitative um, studies or the results of it, I mean, it's really difficult to say who is nostalgic and who isn't. But when you um, put that into perspective with the um, political history or history politics um, context, what about ideology, this ideo ideologic um, narrative with um, the powerful man in power, Putin, and Putin just recently um, said in a documentary that it has been a tragedy and really a break in or break up in the a collapse in the um, history of Russia. So this that the collapse of the Soviet Union has represented a huge um, influence impact on the history of Russia. And don't you think that this can, let's say, influence the narrative of history politics? I mean, I wouldn't say call it theological I, because I think it's rather a discourse saying that without this, um, let's say, strong leader, everything will fall apart. I mean, it's not about, um, it's about people should, people should not get mingled or let should not take part in politics. No, they should stay out of politics. They should just support the strong leader. And I mean, geopolitics, like I've already said, play an important role because Russia left a lot of, you know, territory. But nowadays in Russia, I think nobody would really wish for re-creating um, or re-establishing the old borders or frontiers. No, I think there are different um, levels of emotionality or of emotions when it comes to the Russian Empire. So, um, I mean, of course, when we think about um, labor or cheap labor, etc., then, of course, this could be a point. But Belarus and Ukraine, some people think, OK, they are part of Russia. They are part of our country. And I mean... Putin, but also other leaders are really um, good in instrumentalizing, using um, the collapse of the system and um, the, this catastrophic time that took place. So the years after the war came down, after the collapse of the Soviet Union, for some people, this has been um, a really a time, a free time, a time of freedom. And for others, it has been a great um, downfall, a great problem, a catastrophe, really a, um, a huge period of chaos and um, criminality was, or crime was on, on the rise, on the rise. And I think we should not deny this reality because it has been real or this, um, these people's reality. And I think what is really um, 
smart about these narratives is to use them for one's own purposes. And I mean, we say, okay, we've got back Crimea and this is part of the narrative. And of course, this represents this imperial strength of Russia and we will be recognized at um, international level. And I mean, it, of course, it won't be recognized by the international community, but nevertheless, um, there is also this idea of, okay, I went on holiday to Crimea when I was a child in the 70s and 80s, and I, I have lovely memories of it. And of course, this plays an important role. Um, and there are different levels of nostalgia that are kind of connected or intertwined. So what about Belarus, Alessia? Because um, for some years, one said it's the last... Um, museum of, of the Soviet Union, but what about the historic links to um, Russia and the Soviet Union? And what picture of the Soviet Union is uh, displayed there officially? I think for everybody who comes to Minsk for the first time, um, everybody would be overwhelmed because of the Soviet architecture and because of so many names of party members who um, uh, are present in the street names and so on. And in almost every Belarusian uh, town or city, there is a Lenin statue uh, in the center. And in Minsk, they, we still have a KGB and we've got a KGB prison. And uh, so um, at first glance, there are very many symbols and names reminding us of the Soviet past and Soviet history, and carrying us back to this past. But behind the facade, uh, um, very many independent uh, scenes developed until 2020. There were many, there was a lot of space for culture um, and also the um, exhibition of uh, memorial about forced labor in 2000. Uh, Org 16, which was organized by Maria Kalesnikova, who also comes from uh, the cultural field. I would rather um, say that, according to my own feelings, the Belarusians uh, have showed uh, very clearly that they want a change. And that this facade and this, the Soviet uh, symbols and patterns of thinking, these are things they want to get rid of. The protests in 2020 showed that um, many, hundreds of thousands of Belarusians showed that they want a change. And this uh, Soviet narrative, uh, which is particularly supported by uh, Lukashenko and his power apparatus, is something they want to get rid of. And when we talk about Soviet nostalgia, I would rather say that many Belarusians um, rather looked to uh, Lithuania or Poland and um, very closely uh, observed how these countries developed uh, in terms of freedom of the press, possibilities, opportunities for the people. So I think that the Soviet nostalgia in uh, Belarus is something that has changed very much uh, in the recent past. And one last question to all of you, but I would like to ask Alicia first. If you had a glass ball um, where you could see uh, your desirable future and compared um, yeah, and, and yeah and, and saw the future of Belarus in 2050, what was what would this future look like? That is difficult to say. And this is rather a question of hopes, what I hope for. I definitely hope that in the short term, many historians, many scholars who are threatened right now and who had to leave Belarus, still have to leave the country, that they will get support and scholarships, that they will get the opportunity to um, keep working in their professions. This uh, is 
incredibly important, um, not only uh, in uh, in the arts, but also uh, in journalism, uh, in the field, in the legal sphere, in the field of culture, and so on. So I hope that in this situation. Um, Belarus will stay on the radar screen of the international community. Did you say 2025? 20, 2050? 2050 or 51? But I think you already mentioned your most important wishes. Misha. Historians hate questions about the future. I still want to ask you about this. I wrote an essay on 2055, but this was an essay on the remembrance on, of the Second World War. If you ask me about um, the future, then I would love a situation in which archives are accessible openly, particularly all archives of the intelligence service and uh, of uh, the KGB, and there won't be any more attempts to control historical research or to um, restrict it uh, by laws, by uh, state authorities, and because I am dealing with Soviet history, the discussion about uh, the Soviet history has completely got rid of um, this um, separation between uh, nostalgia and anti-Soviet feelings, because I think uh, it is very important to understand the history of the 20th century. Thank you. And Yuri? I think that we should rather speak about wishes. Yes, yes, it is a glass ball which shows your wishes. Today, we are in a different situation um, in terms of uh, working with archives. For example, most of his, the historians or most of the archives are open in Ukraine, but I would wish that the society will have enough courage to speak about its history and that these discussions will be um, influenced as little as possible by politics. Of course, politics always has a certain influence on what is uh, on what happened um, in history and how uh, history is processed. But um, I would wish that this influence was as small as possible. Thank you very much. With these wishes, I would like to thank all of you for the impressions that you shared with us. And of course, I hope uh, the best um, for 2051 and in general. I uh, would like to say thank you to our listeners, to everybody who sent us questions. Um, thank you very much for being with us. Our next event will take place on the 25th of January. Our topic then will be without history, suppression of the past in Spain, Portugal and Greece. And last but not least, a warm um, thank you to our interpreters of Echo Konferenz Dolmetschen, who interpreted this discussion into English and made it possible for our international audience to participate. Susanne Konchank and Michelle Toussaint. Thank you very much and see you next year.